Hi, in this video I'm going to talk about the requirement solicitation process. So the first thing you want to do during requirement solicitation is actually identify dif your different use classes and you want to identify them fast and upfront. Um, what I mean by user classes is that those are each of the distinct groups of users for a product. So you want to probably classify users into groups. So perhaps you have probably have uh, people who need super administrator app access to be able to, you know, administrate the site and that kind of thing. And perhaps you need some people to be able to do this one kind of thing as opposed to this other kind of thing and that kind of thing. So your users might differ in um, lots of different areas. So one, one way is by um, how often they use the application. Um, you have to think about how often any one person would use it. Uh, perhaps they would differ any kind of functionality that they're going to use, um, the tasks that they want to actually see accomplished at the end of the day. Um, even more importantly, sometimes it's about the education and skill level of the users um, that would differentiate them. So even within a single class of users, they might be able to subcategorize them by the education and skill level. And then, of course, there's privilege and security level. Um, so some people might need like root access versus some others that would just need like guest type access or something like that. Um, you have to understand that people may belong to uh, multiple user classes and that's okay. Well, what your job is to be able to define what all those multiple roles are and then you could start assigning um, the different users to those mul multiple roles and that's perfectly all right. Um, the other thing you have to understand about user classes is that it doesn't actually have to be a human person. It could be a piece of hardware, it could be another subsystem that your system is going to um, interact with. It could be, um, you know, uh, other software components out there, an API structure. Um, perhaps your, your, your software has to be able to talk to Facebook and Google and some other kind of thing, or again, some specialized kind of hardware they can build, say Raspberry Pi, or maybe some Arduino project, maybe it's an automation arm in the industry, or some kind of thing like that. You know, you have to identify all of these kinds of things, and this is probably going to happen probably early on in the process, like say when you're making a system context diagram, uh, one of those early on type um, diagrams. Um, the other question you have to ask yourself is, can one person actually speak for multiple user classes? Sometimes yes, but um, okay, so consider uh, one thing, you go into um, a particular interview and you're talking to the manager up front and the manager's like, oh, well, you don't need to go and talk to this specific user that works under me because I've been doing that job for like 15 years or plus, um, so I could tell you everything that you want to know about it. Um, well, so the question is, do you actually go and... Um, listen to what that guy has to say. Well, of course you listen to what they have to say, but you can't let them speak for that user class because perhaps he's been out of that job. He hasn't done it more recently in a while. So while he might have um, valuable information right now, he's no longer part of the user class. So therefore, you know, you, you have to take with a pinch of salt. You actually have to talk to someone in that user class right now because the job may have transformed, things may have um, happened since then. And you need to actually get feedback from those actual users. Um, a lot of the times you want to appoint, like, say, a product champion, um, and that's someone um, that, you know, uh, can speak to, for that particular set of users, you know, a super user in that set of users. Um, that, that being said, you want to also document all the user classes that you find in, that, in your SRS document so that you know all the different kind of persons that you need to go and talk to. And... I want you to bear in mind that not all user classes are as important to you. So perhaps that um, the main focus of your application is for one user class, so while you have to, to take into account all of the other user classes and that kind of thing, um, sometimes you're going to end, end up having to identify a favorite. And then even more importantly, inside those user classes, um, what you really, really, really have to be able to do is um, is actually be able to tell how you can to manage the conflict. So you have to decide that pretty early. So let's say there are about 10 people in one user class. Um, what if one person gives you conflicting information to what another person is telling you? How are you going to actually manage that conflict? Um, perhaps you're going to just listen to see the person that's um, most senior, most understands the problem. And making that decision is very difficult. Uh, because you're usually at a way off and try to figure out who, who to actually listen to. And that's sometimes a very difficult thing to do. So that being said, um, here are 10 elicitation techniques that you can use 
to um, actually figure these kinds of things out. So the first and probably simple way of doing this is to actually create a survey or questionnaire. Um, that's, this is actually kind of useful, especially if you have a very broad base and you want to get a spectrum of information across user classes. Sometimes you have to, to um, you know, customize your survey or questionnaire based on user class and send it out to, to each one of user classes separately. And, um, you know, um, kind of try and figure out what's going on with each one. Um, so again, this is very good for a very large base, and you just want to get a general sense of a lot of ideas. Uh, of course, you have to prepare a lot for surveys and questionnaires. You'd have to make sure not to get it too long, otherwise, you know, people won't want to fill it out. Um, you have to actually just kind of focus in on the problem um, that you want to actually figure out. Um, so usually this is not something you want to go up front with. You need to actually have some kind of understanding of the area. and. Um, after you have some kind of basic understanding, then you can craft this in such a way that you can get a large uh, pool of information uh, about things that you're not that clear on. Um, another very popular one is what you call observation. Now, observation is all about, you know, you go out um, and you uh, observe the user as they do what they do normally. And yeah, uh, you could create like video recordings, you could, you know, do different things and take notes perhaps and uh, see what it's actually like. And that's a way for you to actually learn about what, what the actual issue is in the field. Um, this is actually really great and you actually get a whole lot of information here and you learn about the problem a lot more um, specifically. The problem with observation is that it usually takes a bit of time. Um, there are two types of observation you can do. There's passive approach, which is you just go, you sit down, you don't interfere, you really don't interfere, and you just observe and take notes or you record, and you just see what the person is doing. Um, the other kind of observation you could do is the active approach. The active approach is where uh, you, you, you interrupt and you ask questions as you go along. So um, you, you become kind of infused in the process that way. There are different trade-offs about which one you want to do. Sometimes when you take an active approach, you may interrupt the user and end up focusing on um, some nitty-gritties ra rather than um, the holistic view. Um, so sometimes some people say, well, perhaps a pa passive approach is better. But uh, the passive approach is not always better because, you know, you don't actually get an um, sometimes you may not be clear as to why a person did what they did in certain circumstances. The next way that you can um, elicit ideas is by doing a quick prototype or mock-up. So, you know, you could do a quick mock-up of what you're doing, um, of what you think um, they want, and then just ask them for feedback. So there are two ways you could approach prototyping. There is, um, uh, first of all, horizontal prototyping. So horizontal prototyping is like you create a user interface. You could use um, any kind of simple tool to do this. Um, Balsamic, um, Go Mockingbird, uh, Microsoft Visio, or the old basic um, old fashioned, you know, paper and pen. And you know, you just draw some quick screens or something like that. And um, you show it to the users and uh, get, get their feedback on what, what do they think. Um, a lot of times with doing a horizontal prototype, which is like UI mockups and using frame, um, wireframing type tools, is that sometimes users are like, oh, this was really easy. Um, and they don't really understand that in the background, there isn't really much going on. So sometimes it's about managing the expectations when you do UI mockups and these kinds of things. Um, the other kinds of prototyping you can do is what you call vertical prototyping, which is um, well, we're not that concerned with, say, the user's, the user's view of it. Perhaps they're asking for um, some kind of specific way of doing it, like an algorithm or something like that, that we're not that sure about. So what we do is a quick mock-up of that in order to, you know, figure out whether or not we can actually do that, whether it's actually feasible to do that particular algorithm, um, and uh, just see if we can do something like that and whether that's actually feasible. Um, that, that's also useful. So prototyping is a risk management type tool in that we could try and figure out whether or not we can do these kinds of uh, things. And again, uh, you can listen to the life cycle videos on um, Troy and evolutionary prototyping um, to get a little bit more information on that. All right, the next way that we can elicit is um, what actually naturally follows uh, any kind of elicitation technique, which is modeling the process. And you could use the standard modeling diagrams that we'll talk about in the next 
um, set of videos to actually figure that out and that is all about you know sharing with the user your modeling diagrams and that kind of thing and sharing with other engineers and other persons in your development team um, what you think you've just heard from your users and in so doing you kind of actually learn a little bit more about the process because when you, when you put it on pen and paper and you try to model that whole end-to-end -end type process you get a better sense of what you need to do um, this uh, and as much as I'll probably talk about this uh, you're probably not going to understand that until you actually try to do it so um, try, try that out and then you'll, you'll get an idea um, the next elicitation technique you can use is interviews so here you go and you sit down one-on-one -on -one with um, a user in a particular user class and you um, just basically have a conversation with them um, and you know you want to make sure you stress on what it is that the user is doing you don't you make it about the user really and truly it's about their problem itself focus on them and their problem not necessarily on what the system will do up front um, and that way you know you could you have to get a better idea of what's going on the key to interviews is that you have to prepare up front what are the types of questions that you're going to ask and how you're going to deal with certain circumstances and remember you have to get down to be able to write something that's actually testable at the end of the day so um, you, you need to be able to ask a probing type question and then um, keep asking he tends to insert your own opinions too too much in there but it is useful to be able to actually um, uh, uh, insert in insert something if only if you want it validated or invalidated as to whether or not you want to um, make sure that uh, you are actually understanding what they're saying so um, active listening techniques you could google that uh, very good approaches as to how to do interviews in those kind of um, circumstances the next way you want to do um, elicitation techniques is what you call brainstorming in brainstorming you have to remember that you are just a facilitator brainstorming is if you don't have an idea yet okay it's about gathering users in order to you know uh, get an idea so a lot of times what we were doing is that there is an idea somewhere out there and we're just trying to um, figure out what that idea uh, try to flesh that out but brainstorming isn't good in that situation brainstorming is if you need to come up with the idea and you need to set a whole, set all of your um, different user classes down sometimes you can do it um, with you have different people from different stakeholders um, come together or you have a bunch of people from a single user class either way is fine uh, it all depends on what you're trying to accomplish at the end of the day um, the next method is what you call focus groups so focus groups are opposite of brainstorming that since brainstorming is about um, getting the idea focus groups are we have an idea and we're going to actually sit down and focus behind that idea and try and flesh it out a bit more so usually with focus groups you have to get a whole bunch of people from the same um, user class together and you're focusing on one specific type idea so you have to have multiple focus groups meetings in order to um, figure out uh, or, or, uh, across the board what should we be doing you know um, and then on a big scale requirements workshops are like you can think of them as like massive focus groups all in one place and time where we gather a whole bunch of people and we separate them into like sub teams where the sub teams can now talk about um, different things um, you could have like speakers um, you could have little formal walkthroughs and that kind of thing it's just a big kind of event where you know you could go through um, a whole set of ideas all at once for kind of workshops take a bit of putting together um, and they're usually used for like very big and complex situations um, another way is what you call document analysis this is very important in that you probably want to get things like division and scope document of the um, particular organization that you're looking for maybe um, you want to look at the documents that some of the users use on a daily basis to guide them on their day-to-day tasks um, and this is sometimes also very useful when you don't actually have a user to talk to and sometimes it's also about clearing up um, some of the issues in the business domain itself and then the last way we'll talk about is what you call interface analysis so it's interface analysis is all about okay the system that we're going to build here today perhaps is talking to another machine another piece of software what is that API going to look like what are the kind of transactions that are going to occur um, 
um, what 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 is actually needed um, between those interfaces, between the interfaces um, between your system and other say non-human um, uh, systems, and that that's it in a nutshell as to the different kinds of elicitation techniques that you can use during um, your requirement elicitation. Uh, as for any other tips that you um, might need, just remember up front you want to focus on the why. And just like in a previous video, we talked about why and how that deals in what. You want to make be sure what is it that the users do, make it about them. Um, you, and you don't want to bog yourself down up front in the how and how are you going to implement it. Just have to remember that that, that is key during um, any kind of list. Um, and requirements gathering type process. Um, so that's about it for this particular video. Tune in for your next one. Okay, take care. Bye.